Dr. LaPuma is clinical director of Chef Clinic, co-founder of Chef MD, and a New York Times bestselling author. He has led clinical trials of nutritional interventions designed to improve obesity, hypertension, osteoarthritis, insomnia, and diabetes. Dr. LaPuma hosts PBS's new national series, uh, Chef MD Shorts, and his most recent book is Men Don't Diet, Men Refuel. Please welcome Dr. LaPuma. Thank you, Dr. Ross. And thank you all. Uh, let me thank Mark especially for the invitation, the mentorship, the kindnesses, and, and uh, real uh, friendship you've shown over the years. And uh, I'm so grateful for that and for so much else. Uh, and for all of you staying here through lunch, or not through lunch, as the case may be. Um, uh, it turns out, and this is a modified title, I know that most of you were actually expecting a demo, and many of you know I've been to cooking school and taught cooking school, and so I was really hoping to do a cooking demo, but sadly, there is no cooking in the law school. <laughs> And I, you know, I just really worry about the health of future attorneys, but, <laughs> but I guess we can negotiate that in the next election. Um, instead, I am standing in a dangerous place between you and lunch um, on the south side of Chicago, just about to talk about food, not just any food, but comfort food. And so uh, I want to ask your indulgence, and, and I'll dive right in and try to, to make it worth your while to stay. Uh, I want to, to ask first, uh, with a show of hands, who here has suggested a food or a meal to a patient for a medical condition? Maybe 30, 40%. Okay. Who here has used a food or a meal for her own or your own medical condition? Also about 40% and it looks like a different 40%. <laughs> so I want to try to talk with you today about how comfort food can cure. This is also not my title, but I'm uh, happy to rise to the uh, challenge. Uh, here, three parts. What is comfort food? When to prescribe it? And comfort food is culinary medicine. Um, this is Jamie Oliver's, the cover of Jamie Oliver's new book. Who here knows about Jamie Oliver? Only about 25% of us. Jamie Oliver is the naked chef, not for his uh, lack of clothes or Anne Dudley Goldblatt uh, kind of emulation, but instead for his food, which is unadorned, at least it used to be, and he now actually, and has for eight or 10 years, actually dramatically improved the quality of the food served to school children in Britain and has made a similar effort in the United States, not quite as successfully. Here he talks with, um, with uh, Stephen Colbert. I'm going to play this clip. Uh, it's very short, so I may have to play it twice, which is fine, uh, about what comfort food means. Remember, he's been t uh, talking about food and cooking food that is especially healthy. So short clip. This is the Colbert Report in 60 seconds. Or a beautiful stew or curry or pot roast or meatballs that just kind of makes you feel like you want to hug you, or you're getting a hug. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, Eventually your body hugs you all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got that. Okay. I won't play it again then. So, so this clip in 12 seconds summarizes our conflicting feelings about comfort food. On the one hand, it's incredibly soothing, and on the other hand, it's incredibly unhealthy. Right? Well, maybe not. So this really begs the question, what is comfort food? I think comfort food is memory, history, culture, and identity rich, all those four things. Tasty food eaten to maintain or regain mood. Comfort food comes in four categories. Nostalgic, indulgent, convenient, and physical comfort. Those actually are not my categories, although the definition is mine. Um, those are uh, categories derived from the psychology literature and reiterated there. 
Comfort food is not, despite what you might think, primarily macronutrient driven. It's not primarily carbs or primarily fat. Uh, certainly not primarily alcohol and uh, not primarily protein. It is, it does tend to be more indulgent than not, but I'll show you some comfort food shortly that actually might verge into healthy and we'll talk about what that difference is. Men and women choose very different comfort foods. You heard Jamie Oliver describe the pot roast or the curry. Men generally choose meals as comfort food. Um, it makes them feel cared for. It often reminds them of home and sometimes of their mom. Um, they have positive triggers for comfort food. Men generally eat comfort food as a reward. Women, completely different. Women eat comfort food that is sugary, fatty, crunchy. They use it to console themselves, not a reward and they feel guilty after eating it. That's a really big difference. Now, there are good, uh, that data comes from, the, by the way, from Cornell and Brian Wansink, who has studied behavior in food a lot. Um, and, and yet there are good reasons for this, both physiologically and psychologically. Um, and comfort food is actually both. It's both physiologic and psychologic. Um, in physiology, and here are some of the abstracts that uh, I found important and papers that I think are useful uh, about uh, using comfort food as uh, self-medication. No one really knows the mechanism for this, although a lot has been actually found in animals, very different kinds of theories, whether it's endogenous endorphin release or cholecystokinin release in the intestine because many, much of comfort food is fatty and so that fills you up right away. Um, whether it's cortisol release and a, a modification in the cortisol response as you respond to stress, or extra serotonin synthesis from all those carbs, because actually there are often a lot of carbs, or if it's just the body's way of telling the brain, you know, you can relax, you're refueled, you've got lots of high energy food. No one really knows. Similarly, the psychology of it is, is puzzling as well. You know, the popularity of mac and cheese and chicken pot pies went way up after September 11th. But it wasn't the fat or the carbs or the calories. It's because people knew what to expect when getting those dishes. And we often, as you remember, didn't know what to expect after September 11th. So this is really quite complex and, and, and interesting. However, too much comfort food, uh, as Stephen Colbert was pointing out, can make David go from this to that. <laughs> and we don't want that, but in fact, it happens to too many of us. And, and there's a reason for that. And it's because when you put, have too much comfort food, really too much any food, you, you gain visceral fat. And in men, that changes testosterone to estrogen. And men and women, it increases inflammation and cytokines. It, and you, you, you blunt your insulin response. You just feel awful. And that's what happens. But it doesn't have to happen. This is Paula Wolfert. Uh, who knows who Paula Wolfert is, anybody? One, two. Aww. Paula is a colleague and friend who probably knows more about Mediterranean cooking than anyone in this country. Um, her books are uh, The Slow Mediterranean Kitchen and Couscous, Another Good Food from Morocco. Um, she's the doyenne of Mediterranean cooking. And interestingly, uh, she has Benson's disease, which as you know is an atypical variant of Alzheimer's disease, sort of a visual analog of it. And so her memory is going. And so she's trying to use culinary medicine or food as medicine to forestall the neurologic loss. And it's actually being successful. She's blending avocados and blueberries and three kinds of coconut into a blender every morning and, and uh, giving herself a shake. And in fact, her, her uh, deterioration is stabilizing. Although, of course, she's doing other things as well. Paula wrote for PBS, who did a series on comfort food, uh, about her recipe, chicken smothered in cracked green olives, which, by the way, has two small chickens and four quarts of cracked green olives. That's a lot of cracked green olives. This recipe, my chicken smothered in cracked green olives, is the dish I was going to make for my son, she wrote, who is coming home for Christmas. I thought it would bring back family memories of living in Morocco when he was growing up. The smothered was very important here because it's over the top. 
It's pushing the point. It's making memories in technicolor. I'm comforted by making this memory for my children. So another aspect of comfort food, we see someone who prepares it with love and remembers with love how it was prepared. And here actually are some of the foods that we ourselves either um, save for a sick day for soothingness or use to celebrate. This is a, actually Paula's um, uh, chicken with cracked green olives and some preserved lemon on top and lots of parsley. But more familiarly, uh, macaroni and cheese cheeseburgers and french fries, you notice the little beef on top, um, mashed potatoes and gravy, deep dish Chicago pizza because we're here, uh, why else? Spaghetti and meatballs because we're anywhere, uh, chilaquiles, which is a dish of sauteed tortilla chips with a chili sauce, uh, cotija or another uh, Mexican cheese on top and a fried egg, which we used to make at Topo Bombo at 1130 at night after serving, um, although that egg looks like it's not quite runny enough. And of course, that's an interesting kind of preference because I really haven't said and want to now that comfort food, among all other things, is intensely personal. It's not just culturally memory identity rich, it's personal. What your comfort food is, is for you. And it's as individual as people are. This is matzo ball chicken soup, um, which of course is one of the more, uh, which looks like a more traditional healthy food. I mean, it's broth and carrots and a little bit of parsley and whatever matzo balls are made of. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then we move to ice cream pecan pie. This is a pecan pie ice cream uh, chocolate chip cookies. And you should pay attention, by the way, to the chocolate chip cookies uh, outside on the side table. I'll tell you why at the end of the talk. Uh, a glazed cinnamon roll and a frosted cupcake. Some people believe that the frosting on the cupcake is a separate comfort food from the cupcake itself. <laughs> That probably deserves a, really like a federal grant, I don't know. And, and, and you can, in fact, buy a meatloaf cupcake here in Chicago, um, combining uh, the, the snackiness of cupcakes and the meal of meatloaf. I, I don't really know who would buy it, but I'm sure they're all really popular. Um, and then donuts. You might be interested to know that the Glaze on a donut is trans fat combined with powdered sugar. They take a little bit of Crisco, they put powdered sugar on it, and they put it on your donut. Uh, fried chicken and waffles, because we're very close, really, to the mecca of fried chicken and waffles. And then a turco wandi, who himself is not a comfort food, but instead, <laughs> instead has written a really great book called Being Mortal, which I recommend. If you haven't read it, you should, because I think it has the potential to make public a debate about end-of-life care that we really have not made public in a, in a really constructive way. Um, Gokwandi, as you know, is a surgeon at Harvard who also writes for The New Yorker, writes brilliantly, and uh, he writes about, about uh, food in, uh, uh, near the end of life and about our goals in medicine. He writes, we've been wrong about what our job is in medicine, he says. We think it's to ensure health and survival, but really it's to enable well-being, and well-being is about the reasons that one wishes to be alive. Those reasons matter not just at the end of life or when debility comes, but all along the way. Food is the hundred years war in retirement facilities. A woman with severe Parkinson's disease keeps violating your period diet restrictions. A man with Alzheimer's disease hoards snacks in his room, violating house rules. A diabetic is found eating clandestine sugar cookies and pudding, knocking his blood sugar way off target. Medicine has forgotten how vital such matters are to people. We want autonomy for ourselves and safety for those we love. People want the right to lock their doors, dress how they like, eat what they want. So. This is the second part of the talk. When do you prescribe comfort food? I think there are three indications at least. One is to do what Gawande suggests. When you want to enable well-being and quality of life, I think a comfort food, should a patient want it, is a really good thing. You want to trigger feelings of caring and healing, certainly if you want to improve anorexia. And most of all, when health and survival are not the primary goals, when they're secondary. 
Second, when you want to, with a patient, honor autonomy more than safety, when someone really needs that feeling of independence and, and kind of a demonstration of it, I think you want to say, what would you like to eat? What's your favorite food? Let me get it for you or let their family get it for them. And then third, when you want to explore fears, goals, and trade-offs, uh, instead of simply deciding for patients or just giving them information, but when you want to have an actual relational discussion. I think these three ideas form the basis of my suggested indications for prescribing comfort food, and I suggest you use an actual prescription slip. Part three. Comfort food is culinary medicine. The art of food and cooking blended with the science of medicine is the definition of culinary medicine that has as a mission restaurant quality meals that aim to prevent and treat disease um, with its vision being that of an accessible, effective, safe toolkit in a clinician's, uh, in a clinician's pocket. Um, and actually culinary medicine is becoming a thing. There, the first course, uh, cooking nutrition course, was taught at the State University of New York Upstate in 2004. Harvard has a CME conference that's oversubscribed every year uh, since 2007. Uh, Tulane has a curriculum that is now licensed to nine different medical schools in culinary medicine. Uh, I taught the first clinical student elective uh, with Des Moines University and Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital last year. Um, it's becoming a thing, and this is part of culinary medicine. So, use your prescription pad, write a prescription for comfort food, especially for patients near the end of life and perhaps at other times. Don't worry about healthy or nutrition in comfort food. Uh, it's not the primary goal. The primary goal is to enable well-being. And then write prescriptions for condition-specific healthy recipes for patients who are not near the end of life because there are such prescriptions and they're available. Um, I want to give you a taste of a comfort food that I is important to me. Uh, these are beehives uh, on my property in Santa Barbara. I have a little organic farm and take care of bees and uh, harvested this raw, hand-extracted, unfiltered honey and with friends centrifuged it down and brought you all samples in a little <coughs> straw that you can find on the chocolate chip cookie table. The reason this is important, other than it's really incredible and you'll like it, um, is because as a clinician who is really interested in food and thinks that it can be a therapeutic tool, it's, it's safety, it's uh, flavor and depth of flavor, and the ability to savor this comfort food is something that I treasure and is a way to, to avoid going from uh, David in 1504 to David in uh, 2014. <laughs> Savoring comfort food is the secret to its cure. Thanks very much. We go way, way back, Dr. Lupuma. I met you when I was a clinical dietitian. So if you want to learn how to make Mott's ball soup, I'll be happy to do that. Thank you very much. And to anyone else, what I've done over the past 10 years is take physicians one-on-one -on -one and teach them, as Dr. Lupuma has presented, culinary medicine. And now it's exploded. And as he mentioned, it's in all of the major medical centers, but also around the world. So what I want to turn to is coming from California, raising your honey, having all of these wonderful access, would you comment on what about having in every community clinic a garden and having our patients invested in really nurturing what it is they're then going to consume and nourish and sustain? I also want to add, I spoke with Atul Gawande when he was here. And I suggested that we take his lab 
and meet with patients' families and ask them what those foods are. Because I think larger than the nutrients that's in food, you touched on what the memories were. And Dr. John Morley, who I'm sure you know at Wash U, has always, for 20 years, said at some point, we need to give patients over the age of, say, 75, what foods they really enjoy. We need to count less and care more. So I welcome your conversation on these points. Thank you, Maria. I uh, thank you especially and for your own work. Um, there is actually great data about community gardens and community health, uh, uh, one that's actually emblematic and illustrative of that movement in the Bronx, um, where uh, the sociodemographics are terrible. But the kinds of uh, contribution in creating and in, in employing members uh, living around what was a terrible block uh, filled with drug dealers and, and uh, rusted cars before, but now is a community garden that sells its extra produce at the farmer's market, distributes it to people in need, and it actually lowers blood pressure for the people who participate in it in a standardized, uh, careful way, um, is in fact a really powerful tool. And so this can, you know, Alice Waters started this in the late 80s in the, with the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley. Uh, and so there are many such interventions that we can offer and I think they all ought to be tried and integrated into education once they are helpful and effective. Um, I don't want to stand between us and lunch any longer.